I was away the last two weeks at a priest workshop in Chicago. The diocese expects our, us as priests to go out and do two weeks of continuing study each year. So I was with other priests doing discussion and prayer and reading. But when we first arrived in Chicago, I was looking for a church to pray Mass in. I hadn't offered Mass yet that day. And we stumbled upon a beautiful old Polish parish. But as we went in, we realized on the left side there was a side altar. It was a chapel dedicated to St. Peregrine, who is the patron saint of those with cancer. This was the national shrine to St. Peregrine. They had a relic, a piece of bone of Peregrine. He was a Franciscan who had cancer, and one day while praying before a crucifix, his cancer was miraculously healed. Well, here at St. Philip's, we started a St. Peregrine cancer ministry about a year ago. It's a group of our parishioners who are suffering from this illness. They come together to encourage each other to share ideas and to pray for each other. So it's very providential. We had actually had mass there at the altar in the National Shrine of St. Peregrine. So prayed for all the parishioners who have that illness. And so I was praying and thinking about the parish all the past two weeks, but it's good to be back. Today we focus on our second reading, which is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. He's writing a letter to the early Catholic community in the city of Rome. And he was hoping to be able to go visit them. This letter was kind of his prelude to his visit. As it turned out, he did go to Rome, but not quite the way he expected. He was captured in Jerusalem and then sent to Rome as a prisoner to be tried before Caesar. He lived in Rome for two years, and then, as we know, he was executed, he was martyred, he was beheaded. But in this letter, it's the longest of Paul's letter. He wrote 14 letters that we still have today. Of the 26 books of the New Testament, 14 are written by Paul. The letter to the Romans is the longest. It has the most theology. Today we focus on the excerpt that we read. Paul speaks about the Holy Spirit of God, right? As Christians, again, we believe that God is three persons, a Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And each affects us differently. Paul in Romans is focusing on the Holy Spirit. And he has two particular points he makes in today's reading. First, that the Holy Spirit of God reminds us of our value as human beings, of our great worth in the eyes of God. Paul says in the reading today, the Spirit of God dwells in you, and the Spirit of Christ belongs to you. That God, the Holy Spirit, dwells inside of us somehow. This is a uniquely Christian understanding. This is the essence of Christianity. All religions believe in a God, some vague sense of God, God far away. Christians understand that, in fact, God wants to come inside our soul and be very close, to have communion with God, that his spirit and our spirit are mixed. It's something we keep going back to and reflecting upon. It's very profound. It tells us a lot about who we are as humans. One of the things we discussed at the workshop the past two weeks was how the, the Catholic view differs from other world religions. If we look at Islam, which is the second largest world religion after Christianity, the word Islam means submission. It really emphasizes that human beings should submit to God's will, that we should obey God. And that's very true. But Islam stops there. That's just where Christianity begins. We should submit our will to God but Christians also say we should engage our minds, that somehow we can know God, we can understand God, that we can relate to him, and not just engage our minds, but also engage our heart, that we can love God, that there's an affection between he and us. Islam doesn't understand this. Buddhism, Hinduism, they don't have any concept of this, that we can know God and we can love God, that God actually wants to be inside of us, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So if that's true, God has great affection for us. We're very valuable. That makes us understand our worth. It should increase our self-confidence. When we leave here today, we should be more confident than when we came in. You have value. We think of Mary, right? Mary had God literally inside of her. She carried Jesus in her womb for nine months. And so too we, when we pray, we invite the Holy Spirit inside of us. So our value, the second thing that Paul emphasizes about the Holy Spirit is that he gives us strength. 
Paul says in the reading today, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, you will live. Paul is saying sometimes the desires of our flesh, of our body, our appetites, they lead us to make destructive decisions, choices. They kill us spiritually. Whereas the Holy Spirit wants to give us good desires to know the right things to choose in life so that we'll thrive, we'll be healthy, we'll be at peace. Sometimes our conscience, guided by God, tells us the right thing to do, but sometimes our body, our desires, wants to do something different, right? We're split. There's a conflict within us. It's due to original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. Because they disobeyed God, not only was there a division between them and God, but also each of us individually in our heart, there's this struggle. The reading today was from the 8th chapter of Romans, but if we look at the 7th chapter, right before that, Paul says, Indeed, I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. I take delight in the law of God, but I see in my body another principle, at war with the law of my mind. Paul says there's a war going on inside of us. Our mind tells us the right thing, what God wants, but our body sometimes wants something different. We see that, right? We have good desires, but they can be twisted. So we desire to eat. We need to eat. We die if we don't eat. And yet sometimes we want to eat too much. We want to eat unhealthy food. If we're an adult, we might want to take a drink. That in itself can be good. But sometimes we want to drink too much, and we become drunk, and that becomes a sin. Or we want to drink at the wrong time. I want to drink, but I have to drive. It's not the right time. So to control those desires, we want to sleep. You need to sleep. God made us to sleep. But sometimes we sleep too much. The alarm goes off, it's time to get up. If we sleep through the alarm, we might mess up the schedule of our day. If we don't show up at work, we get fired. So the desire for sleep is good, but it's a desire that has to be controlled. Sometimes our body, our, our soul wants sensual pleasure. And if we're married, we can seek that and, 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 and act it out in love to our spouse. But sometimes we want that pleasure when we're not married. And so what should lead to love can lead to lust which harms us and harms others. So the desire is good, but it has to be controlled. It has to be used at the right time, at the right place, with the right person in the right way. So the body sometimes pushes one way, the Holy Spirit pushes the other. The goal is to bring the two together so that they're working in harmony, so that what we know is right is also what we desire. We call that virtue. Virtue is a good habit when it becomes easier to choose what is good. And in this case, we're talking about the virtue of temperance. We temper our desires. When we say someone loses their temper, what does it mean? They feel anger and then they act out inappropriately. They yell or they use violent language or a violent action. They acted in a destructive way. So temperance is controlling our desires. And this is something the Catholic faith really emphasizes that what God has made in the natural world is good. It's for us to use as long as we can use it with self-control. Right, there are some religions that say you can't use alcohol. Islam says that. Some Protestant denominations. Catholics say you can, but you have to control it. Now some people realize they can't control it. They have a particular weakness. They have to give it up altogether. That's prudence. So the Catholic Church says these things are good as long as we use them well. And how do we grow in that virtue of temperance? And how do we harness that strength of the Holy Spirit? It begins with sacraments, right? God gave us baptism the first time the Holy Spirit enters our soul in a very formal, visible way. When we get a little bit older, we follow up with confirmation. So it begins with the sacraments, but then we should build on it every day in our daily prayer. Invite the Holy Spirit into your soul. And sometimes in our daily prayer, we have a lot of things we want to ask God for. Before you go to your list, just try to set aside five minutes maybe of quiet time Say, Holy Spirit, come into my soul. And then quietly consider what thoughts or desires is he giving you. That's how you let him work. Maybe that's a habit you want to start this week. Just five minutes a day of quiet prayer to the Holy Spirit. When I was away this week, I got a call. One of our parishioners was very sick. And so I couldn't bring in the sacraments. Of course, I was away. But we just prayed over the phone. And that's what we prayed. Just invite the Holy Spirit into your soul. That's the essence of prayer. Communion with God. 
So that daily prayer and then Holy Communion on Sunday as we do today. In the sacrament of Holy Communion, we bring God inside. We consume Jesus, his body and blood. But once he dissolves into our body and blood, when we leave, it's the Holy Spirit who remains within us. That's who we bring home to our families, to our neighbors, and our co-workers through the week. And so my brothers and sisters, the joy, the goodness of our Catholic faith to engage the Holy Spirit in this way by being here this Sunday, receiving him into our soul should help us to understand our value, boost our confidence, that he'll change our desires, give us strength to choose what is good and true. So that when we leave here, our week will be better. By virtue of being here, putting this time, our week will be better. And hopefully others will see that. They'll see our sense of worth, our temperance, and they'll be attracted to join us here. As we grow, as we become better, that we might draw others to receive this gift as well. Amen.